Introduction to E183, and um, followed by Mark, we'll do some demos of some different things that we've done in proof of concepts with RITDB, and then we will follow up with some details on the features that we put in place for RITDB client that kind of meet the standard requirements. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of history. Um, RITDB was kind of born out of a group um, in CAST where we were trying to do some improvements to STDF. So we were just improving STDF, adding capabilities like um, scan data and then a memory data, et cetera. And while doing that, we just we found that, you know, that was, wasn't really enough for what was needed for the future. And so we started working on RITDB in, in order to build something that was, one, a more modern architecture, and two, that could satisfy adaptive test requirements in HIR. And what we found is in order to do that, we needed to be able to see what was going on in the tester in real time. So we started working on a standardized approach that would allow us to share and consume data throughout the IC process, because as you know, um, if you're looking at the HIR, they, you know, we need data to go from probe to final. We need information from assembly to, pro, um, to uh, final test. You know, we may even need some information from shipping or from planning or dis distribution of uh, materials. Who knows? There's all kinds of things to support man smart manufacturing that are needed. And we wanted a system which would allow us to get data from these variety of data sources and be able to use them within the test cell. So the main goal was to support smart adaptive tests with the ability to do feed forward and feedback and be able to deploy some machine learning algorithms to enhance yield. So we wanted to address those challenges. This included security and provenance of the data. The, we wanted to make sure that the integrity of the data was something that we could address. Because if we're going to do something real time, we can't really afford to have to clean it up in order to use real time data. Of course, that's going to be very problematic. So the, the next question is often asked of us, why do we need a common data format and event standard for semiconductor test? Um, if we look at it in industry 4.0, I mean 3.0, we have industry standards that are sufficient, but they're kind of independent of each other. We have something on the tester, um, something on the handler, or at least the minimum piece of something on the handler, sex gem, et cetera. These are all kind of independent. They don't address the integration of the test cell very well. So it's a host worker model. It's point-to-point -point connection, topology. There's automation of the process focusing on what's needed uh, only. And it's a focus on setup and monitor. So along comes industry 4.0 where we need collaborative standards. These are collaborative floor, machine-to-machine -machine communications, uh, more of a peer-to-peer -peer model, the ability to do adaptive flow changes, and use all available data in the test cell. Um, what do I mean by all available data? Um, we might have load board diagnostics. We might have test data logs. We might have information about the equipment. We might have, I don't know, some kind of quality measure that occurs at the test cell. You know, we might have some information from the controller on the test cell. All of these things today are often independent data sources going to separate places that are integrated post-run. And what we're looking at, how do we make it easier to use that in the middle of the run? So. The, the other thing to note is in many cases in the back end, there are many small improvements needed to reduce the barriers to make large or, or eventually to add up to large impacts in the operation. So it's not necessarily always going to be that one killer app that's going to give you 10% capacity improvement. It's lots of small things combined together that will give you an improvement in your back end floor. Equipment roles can change. You know, instead of limited data, we want all the data. We never really know what we're going to need to look at. You know, it's kind of those hidden signals uh, that, that we need to find and in, in what impacts the um, performance at a test cell. Adaption requires real-time responses. So if we want to adapt, we need to be able to look at everything uh, at the beginning of the run, use that and use data within the run to kind of adapt and, and build a smarter test cell. 
The other piece is we have resource limitations. We, we don't have enough engineers to support a lot of data sources. So what we're hoping to do is create a standardized methodology that can be used for any data source. So, you know, it's, it's um, kind of ubiquitous. I can use this same methodology whether I'm doing end-of-line electrical wafer acceptance testing, I'm doing metrology data collection, I'm doing probe, I'm doing final, maybe I want to collect some data from assembly. It's all in a similar structured format that can be easily integrated together. So my biggest work is on the data. Um, content in terms of the metadata that I think is important and not the structure uh, of the data. So again, in smart manufacturing, we, we need to go beyond automation. So RITDB, we've tried to look at some of the cornerstones of smart manufacturing and say, how do we address this? So in terms of Internet of Things, RITDB is based on MQTT and uses CBOR, which is a concise binary object res representation to, to have, um, you know, the payload is in binary form, which is more concise and gives us a lot of opportunity for different types of data, whether it be actual measured data or images. You know, all of that can be supported by RITDB. Uh, Multi-agent systems, well, we want a smart test cell, so we want to be able to integrate with uh, robots and artificial intelligence or machine learning. Um, big data analytics. We, we want to make it easy for our data to feed into big data and for big, big data to feed information down into the test cell. So how do we make sure that ETL or I guess ELT, which is the new thing, it, you know, extract load and then transform can be supported by this RITDB infrastructure. And then in terms of simulation, um, we have built in uh, the ability to do a replay engine, and the replay engine, we'll talk a little bit more later, is really critical to allowing you to develop real-time applications and to be able to look back at the history as if it were real-time and see kind of what signals you can find in the data. And then finally, we wanted to address HIR traceability. How do we make sure that we have a mechanism to deal with traceability challenges that we have in today's world? So what are some of the expectations for a smart manufacturing backend? Um, sorry, that's not quite as readable as it could be. Um, faster response times. We want real-time alerts and notifications, predictive maintenance, handler assists, AVG or the automatic guided vehicle uh, integration. This is with the robots. How do we make sure that we can do that? To do that, we need quick response times in order to adjust to that. Improved quality. How do we do data integrity checks, process flow, uh, contact monitoring, sockets, probe cards, et cetera, outlier decisions or operational monitors? Um, improved utilization. Um, we, we need to be able to do improvements in our logistics and OEE or uh, operational efficiency. Um, utilization, planning, you know, short versus long. You know, in the back end, it's pretty chaotic. We can do some sort of planning, but who knows how long setup's really going to take or if a lot needs retest. That will affect, you know, when is the tester available. And so maybe we need to integrate better with these uh, dispositioning systems. Maintenance, you know, obviously I think there's, there's a lot of activity going on, whether it be Adventist, Teradyne, or other companies to try to help do better maintenance. Um, you know, we think that we can participate in this with RITDB. Uh, democratization of the data. I think one of the big things about RITDB is to make the data more available to everyone so anyone can come up with innovations and use the data. So the test floor is the data lake. Right? Everything on the test floor gets collected, and when I say test floor, I mean everything. It's burn-in, test, post-test, all of these things are um, on a test floor. Easy insertion, easy use. So we want to make sure that it's easy to use. We want to be able to handle more data, size, uh, data sources for more precise decisions, and then better monitoring. Traceability, we need to trace material, equipment, hardware, steps or recipes, WIP, MES, et cetera. So we want to be able to trace not only the product, but the process. Right? Integration of equipment and systems. So one of the key things that we wanted to make sure we could handle in the back end is legacy. 
So we need to be able to integrate with legacy testers, handlers, probers, and systems. So systems and testers, not quite the same thing. We may have some old software that's running and, you know, I can't get off of that old software on the old testers. And then I've got some new fangled thing that I can do on the new testers. But as a, uh, an OEM, you know, I have to deal with every platform. Things that are 30 years old to things that are, you know, last year. And somehow I have to integrate the whole thing into the back end operation. Um, non-equipment data. We want to be able to uh, interface with non-equipment data that's important for the um, smart manufacturing decisions. And again, other miscellaneous equipment that's in the test cell, anything that's in the test cell, it could be thermal control, could be a laser. Um, obviously, we probably need data from burn-in ovens if we're going to correlate those to test. You know, there's a lot of things that, that we need to take advantage of. So this is just showing you kind of the silicon test data life cycle. And, you know, each one of these have kind of been their own um, isolated environment where, hey, I've got a set of data from my probe site or I've got a set of data from my final test site. And we've done a lot to integrate these in the back end up in the big data. But the key question is, if I need it real time right now, how do I make sure and deliver that and go between these different silos? Um, our goal is to try to facilitate that with RITDB. So in, in many cases, we've got data sharing that's just feed forwarded feedback. How, how do we make it more ubiquitous that I can use anything from anywhere in the life cycle of the semiconductor test? So we've got many data lakes with limited interconnects and most data is local. So those are the two things that we need to figure out how to address. So number one priority that we wanted to do is come up with a better um, format. And so we call these RITDB containers. It's a SQLite. It can be queried using SQL with um, any kind of off-the-shelf tool. There's many of them out there for SQLite that can be utilized. It's a NoSQL narrow table. There's six columns, one table in a SQLite file. Can be machine validated against the spec. So we have a RITDB spec file that follows RITDB spec. <laughs> kind of circular. But um, that RITDB spec file can be used to validate your output um, via software. So there's what we wanted to do is remove spec interpretation. Like, you know, I, I don't know you guys who are familiar with STDF. Every STDF is different based on who interpreted the spec, right? And so validating the STDF is very challenging. So one of the goals of RITDB was how do we reduce that problem? And so we created a machine validated format that could be used to validate the spec. And in fact, we have as part of our tools, a RITDB validator. So the, the next thing is we needed to have metadata. So we have attached metadata for provenance. This allows us to tell where it came from, you know, what's the size of all kinds of different information about this file to ensure the integrity of the content. Now, it, it may ensure that the integrity of this field is the one that was produced in the test cell. I cannot make that field accurate because, you know, that could be your system's problem, but it is correct for what was done at that test cell. Eventually, you can fix your uh, issues that are kind of operational in nature. Validated, this container was validated with many, many different STDF examples. So there was a lot of companies that were participating in the RITDB task force that provided us STDF examples, and we used those to, to uh, test the RITDB container for data logs and make sure that the new container could sufficiently um, hold any data. And in fact, ST had offered a lot of inputs which changed the way we handled uh, equipment identity within the test cell. So there's a lot of uh, inputs that came across from many different companies. Each container is tagged with a use case which defines the rules for expected content. And these use cases um, are things like events is a different use case, a data log.wafer, which is probe, 
data log.unit, which is just your regular singulated unit, data log.strip, which is where you're testing at final test, but in a strip form, and then equipment log.tester. And equipment log.tester is describing the contents of the tester, both hardware and software at the time the equipment log is generated. It's more static. It's not like the load board stack. It's more the tester itself. Okay. So I just want to go through an example of what the data log looks like. So here on the left, you'll see is a PTR out of STDF. So you see you've got the PTR and it's got limits and units of measure in it. And that then translates into RITDB, what's called a result info. The result info gives you all the information that describes your test. What's the test number? What's the um, test description, you, et cetera? Now, I'm not showing it here, but because STDF doesn't really handle it well, RITDB can also handle all the conditions associated to this test. Problem is, if I'm doing STDF to RITDB, I have nothing to convert. But if you're doing native RITDB, that's all can be done, exactly which conditions are set for this test at this moment in time. And by the way, it handles dynamic conditions. So it doesn't handle just static conditions, but also dynamic ones. I just don't have an example because I need a native RITDB uh, implementation. Oops, sorry, backwards. So the next piece you'll notice that there are limits. So in limits, these go into a limits um, how do you say, we, we call them, uh, well, let's say a, a limits object, right? So here in the entity type, yeah, result limit set is the limits. Now we can handle dynamic limits or static limits. You can have multiple types of limit sets. So I could have prod limits and qual limits both in the same file. You know, so we've handled all of those variety of things. Of course, this is a simple STDF file where we have just a set of production limits. And so those production limits are in the result limit set. So if you notice here, here's my mouse, um, that little green arrow that you see that little green arrow is showing you that from the index is the number 721. And you'll notice that the entity ID in the top one is 721. So 721 entity ID, that's like an object identifier, right? It's random for each run. It might be different. It's just an object identifier for the result info. And within the limits, I reference back to it. So I know that on the, the highlighted row where I see LL, which is lower limit, that this value is related to 721, which is for test 1,000. So I'm using that as an object reference and saying, OK, I'm going to point back to this as my limit for this particular result or test. Then we get into the PIR, PRR. So um, I, I guess I should ask, how many are familiar with STDF? Most, <laughs> um, if you're not, you know, see me afterward if you have questions. So PIR, PRR just represents the part under test. So this is telling you, hey, I'm testing this particular part. And in that case, we have a part result event. So a part result event is basically the object which is holding all of the results for that particular run of that part. Or let's say individual insertion of that part in a socket where you do a test flow. And so within there I have my part result record and I have all of the information that is telling me something about the part. What's the part number? It could reference uh, what XY it's from. There, there's lots of things that can reference and point to other objects that tell you which bin, what, what is the resulting bin and the resulting soft bin, etc. Um, FYI, in RITDB, you can have as many bin dispositions as you want on a part. So you're not limited to one bin, one run. You can have many. Uh, let's say I have a bin per instance of a memory 
IP on my part. I can have those in RITDB, no problem. Right? In the end, you have to have a disposition bin, which is the final bin of the part, but you can have as many sub bins or whatever that you want. So it allows you to be a bit more complicated or, or be able to, if you have a system on chip, have binning of pieces of the chip as needed. So this was actually came out of AMD. <laughs> I don't know if you recall, but I think it was maybe four or five years ago, AMD did a presentation on this multi-binning thing. We said, oh, well, we better support that in RedDB. So we do listen to all of the papers and try to identify, hey, is there something RedDB needs to handle that is not being handled today in the environment? So here we have the part result event, and then we have the PTR result. PTR result, again, you notice in the top we had PTR result. We pulled out the information about the test and we pulled out the limits and those went to two different um, entity types. And now we have the result and within the um, part result event, you'll notice we have attributes that are labeled R. Well, why R? It's short and there's a lot of them, so we wanted to reduce the impact on the SQLite file, so it's just R. <laughs> So um, we wanted to minimize the size of the file where possible. So you'll notice we have R. The index ID that's within the RITDB is pointing back to the part result event that tells us what test it is and what's the test name, et cetera. And that would give us all of the condition information that we needed. And we have the measured result. And then you notice there's a value to column. That was added specifically for RITDB because for every result, there's a what? Did it pass or did it fail? Was it valid? Was it invalid? Et cetera, there are flags that go with the result that describe to you the result. So we wanted to, again, keep the SQLite file as small as possible. So we added a new column with a very um, shortened way of adding flags for the results. And by the way, RITDB is highly customizable. So if you want more than the two, uh, flags on the part, guess what? You can add additional flags and have your own custom RITDB spec that is referenced within this RITDB file that tells consumers how to interpret the spec. Right? So in addition to our spec file, as you recall, I talked about RITDB having a, a validator um, spec file that describes it. You can have your own custom spec file that goes on top of the RITDB spec file. You can't violate the spec, but you can add to, right? You can make it stricter. You can't make it looser, but you can make it stricter. And you can have that, and that's referenced within the RITDB file. So again, you can provide your consumer instructions on how to interpret the file. That is your custom um, requirements on top of the standard. So this provides us the results of the RITDB data container. Okay. We also have some applications. So there's some simplified real-time applications that allow you to basically query the file. So you can query this, you know, as it's being generated, you can query it after it's done. And this allows you to query the file and produce a chart, look at, um, you know, a line chart, look at the data as it's being generated. Um, uh, on the tester. So the next thing we wanted to address was provenance. So provenance, this is where, you know, what's the identity of the source? Who created the data? Integrity, is it the data that they created? Security, who can access the data? Classification, there's some kind of grouping by characteristic, uh, source, content, type, product, time, etc. And then lineage, where has it been and what happened to it? So we have these different um, attributes in the metadata that describe things about the data. So creation date, for example, the object class, what type of object is it, um, the format of the object, which should be RITDB, <laughs> if it's a RITDB file, um, you know, the title, um, the tester it came from, et cetera. There's just a whole list of things that you can do beyond what's required in the standard, you can have your own set of custom attributes. And there's a description within the standard of how to add your own custom attributes. Right? Our goal is to not make, our goal is to make RITDB something that's expandable and future proof. Right? And the only way to do that is let somebody add custom stuff to it and then come back and request the standard changes. And we wanted a way to easily move from uh, custom to standard. So if you have a custom attribute, you're required to define your prefix to do your custom attribute. 
and then you can have it and we will never have a clash of standard attributes with customers' custom attributes, right? So we've tried to think of ways to ensure that we give you an opportunity to get what you need out of the uh, data. So I'm sure you've all seen this. So our goal was to kind of look at backend versus material flow. We wanted to say, oh, well, how do we make sure that we can address these different areas so that you'll see here we go from uh, probe, let's see, where we've got bin codes and data log data, et cetera, um, transfer maps. We have validated that we can support E142 being converted into ReadDB, and that actually, oh, thanks. Um, I guess I got to stand close over here, so I'm going to do it like this. Um, so here we've looked at how do we ensure that we can transfer maps up and down, back and forth between RITDB and what you need at runtime. So again, if you're doing feed forward, you're going to need, let's say, from probe to final, and you're doing something where you're doing a trim of a particular XY, I need to be able to feed map coordinates along with some data to the next step. So I have to be able to handle maps. So by reviewing E142, we actually changed the way the spec was formatted so that we could easily transform between E142, which is your map data, into RITDB and vice versa. So we tried to address those as well. And you'll see that we've tried to address the data coming in from the probers, the die attach, we figured, you know, hey, we can handle that too. So if you wanted to collect some data at die attach and feed forward, for example, the bond wire strength, you know, that, that variation of the bond wire strength may affect continuity at FT1, for example. So, hey, maybe I want to have the ability to manage that data and analyze it together. There's other things that, that you might want to do. So we've looked across this whole flow, including going out to a customer and coming back and saying, how do we make sure that RITDB containers can be easily shared? And if you recall, we had talked about security. So you can encrypt the RITDB containers for your customer and give them their data encrypted or not. You know, if you want, if you're very open or it's, let's say it's internal within your own company, you don't need to encrypt it. So all of those things we address so that you can take data from across this flow back and forth and share it, internal and external. So the other thing that we try to do is address Internet of Things the, to enable adaptive tests. So if you'll see here on the left, this is a picture from the heterogeneous integration roadmap that shows the various things, data feed forward, feedback, you know, data within the test cell going back and forth. Um, so we wanted to see, well, how would we fit into the overall architecture? So here you'll see is a picture from Semi that shows kind of the front end all the way to the back end, and then this on tester analytics. Our goal eventually is we want to be able to do things on the tester, have an edge application or an edge appliance, be able to share the data, analyze it, and impact the program, whether it be operational level or within a testing of a die. Okay. How are we on time? Oh, oh, I see. Okay. Well, a little easier here anyway. So now I want to talk about some of the features of a RITDB container or the, the overall RITDB events. So again, we've talked a lot about the container, but RITDB not only deals with containers, but streams of data. So we have capability of integrating batch data with individual streams. What does that mean? Hey, uh, let, for example, I can go grab some data from a previous step, pull that in in RITDB format at the beginning of the run, and then interface that with simply SQL, go query it and pull it back in, and then utilize that data. I could also do that within a run or within an insertion of a die, right? Writing to my SQLite file in the interim, querying from it, saying, hey, what was the previous die like? You know, it's just a simple query. There's no more, you know, um, it becomes a simple function you throw in your software. You give me the stats from the previous 10 die or all of the previous die that were in here. So it's all really easy SQL, right, that, that you can provide to the users. 
It's low overhead clients. We can put the client on a tester. It doesn't take any room. We've tested this in TI across several testers, and we have not had any impact on test time. And um, it's very quick, particularly if the broker is on the tester. So it's a very localized interface with the tester going back and forth using the IoT architecture. It's bi-directional, so we can exchange information between the test cell and anything else connected to RITDB. Of course, you're, we're dealing with connection, security, who has the right to connect and all of that stuff. But hey, if you have the right to connect to the system and you have the rights to you know, control something, you can do bi-directional messaging. And that enables us to do operational control and real-time data analytics. Okay. It's built on top of the IoT architecture. It uses MQTT messaging protocol. So it's an open source message system based on communication enabling plug and play. I think your biggest challenge with MQTT is people going crazy with it outside the standard, reining them back in so they stay within the standard, because once they learn MQTT, they come up with all kinds of clever ways to use it. Um, add layers of security with public-private key sharing rules, so you can add as much or little security as you want with these public-private keys. It's binary messaging, so we're keeping it as small as possible. The other benefit of binary is that I can handle all kinds of data types, whether it be audio files, video files, regular data, etc. And I think this is going to be useful because one of the things I think we'll, we'll need to start exploring is converting data into charts and doing visual machine learning on the charts instead of doing statistics on the data because ML on um, images is much richer than ML on data. <laughs> you know, there could be some interesting things that I've seen people do with that. And I think it's something that we can explore. The fact is that RITDB could handle that, no problem. It's easy to integrate into big data. So here you'll see the logical model. So um, on the bottom lower right, there is a, a logical model for test cell. And you'll see that we have the equipment. And it is communicating bi-directionally with the broker. This is the you know, panacea. The broker's on the tester. And it's communicating back and forth with the broker on the tester. So everything within the test cell is connected to this broker. What does that do? By nature of being connected to the broker, they're all synced in time within the test cell. So I don't have any time clock issues of different things connecting, um, which can really get in the way of real-time processing if things are not quite synced up exactly with the clocks. And anything else, some application, an edge appliance, or you know, test cell controller, whatever, is sitting there talking to the broker within the test cell and communicating back and forth. We've actually implemented this in TI for some different applications, made it really easy for us to communicate with the program through a broker, right? So it kind of gives you a much more plug and play kind of feature. Then there's a connection, what we call a bridge between the broker on the test cell and you know the, the RITDBs sitting on the floor, the system level RITDB uh, appliance. And there I might then have a bridge to other cells within the floor or to other applications. Maybe it's my MES system. Maybe it's um, my dis distribution system, uh, disposition system, who, you, who knows. And you can come up with all kinds of different applications. This is where you on a floor can control, you know, the frequency uh, of information that someone outside of your floor might see. So you, you can control that here. Right? So you, you may not want, you know, 10 millisecond <laughs> frequency, uh, um, how do you say, access to someone sitting over here in the U.S. to Taiwan, but you may be able to give them, you know, updates every five minutes. That's still a heck of a lot faster than waiting till the next day or waiting till the end of the run. You can still see what's going on, but you're controlling your network bandwidth, for example. So there's just a lot of opportunity within here to kind of tweak it for what works for your floor and for your network. And not everybody has a great network with a lot of bandwidth. Right? RITDB can be adjusted to accommodate that as needed. So here's just a high level picture of the RITDB architecture. And you'll see um, these orange boxes here are representing events. So here I have these sources and I have a RITDB client. 
Like I say, many of much of the POCs that we've done are a RateDB client on a tester. And so here you'll see we've got these events. So these are temporal um, messages that are coming across here and being sent and collected um, into the system. Then we have actions. Oh, this is kind of timing itself by itself, huh? Sorry. Um, here we have actions, which is in purple. Those are um, actions where we might, from the system, send uh, a request to the uh, tester, let's say, and ask for something from the tester. Or we might um, send some information down to the tester and actually ask it to respond. Then we have RITDB, which is in the light blue boxes. So those are the containers I was talking about. So here we have a RITDB container um, that gets put into the metadata index repository. I can actually send a full container to, um, or even a partial portion of the container to the RITDB at the next level, so the RITDB system. So I can send just regular events, or I can send RITDB containers through the message. We have multiple data sources. These have two roles. Um, they either publish facts in the, in, in, sorry, this thing is going faster. I don't know why it's moving forward on me. Sorry about that. That's weird. Um, so I'm missing some stuff. So anyway, it can publish data in form of RITDB containers or events as mentioned before. And then um, also it can subscribe to messages. So the tester itself can subscribe to messages to get certain topics that it's going to listen to. Okay. It's again where all these arrows are. This is a pub sub model. So it's a publish and subscribe. So anything attached to the system can either be a pure publisher or, or you know, um, well, actually, it does have to subscribe. There are some required subscriptions for a client, but an application could simply subscribe and listen to data. Right? So here I have these publish and subscribe arrows that you'll see here, and then followed by collect. So in the RITDB system, we have something called the collector. And that's just a guy who's listening or subscribing to everything that's coming in. And then it's figuring out how to collect those into a RITDB container. And then once we've gotten the RITDB container we want, we push it into the metadata index rep repository for historical purposes. Okay. Then we have the metadata index repository. This is just a standard file system, nothing special. There's no database to install like Oracle or anything like this, it's just file storage. And the individual SQLite files are put into the metadata index repository. Do not know why this thing is going forward on its own, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so the metadata index repository, uh, it's got a SQLite file, or the way we implement it, there's a SQLite file that's an index, and it has all of that metadata that we wanted to record about a container, and what's the name of that container, and where is it stored in the file system. So I can query that indexed repo, and look for my files based on certain characteristics, and then go grab the file and then query the file to get out the data. So it gives us a, a really easy way to um, find data we're looking for. The, the beauty of the information or the, the system that we put in place is I can have as many of those indexed informations as I want. So later I could go analyze data and I could find a problem with it. Guess what? I could go back and annotate that index and say, this particular instance of this run has this problem. Or by the way, here's an SQL that you should run against this file because this will show you the problem, right? I can leave all that in the metadata index repository as pointers to the user. So there's a lot of neat capabilities that can be done within the RITDB architecture. Here what I wanted to show you is some of the topics. So remember we had talked about this being IoT and MQTT. So here on the left, these are the standard topic structures that we have that are part of the standard. So the top one you'll see, it says private, it's a private channel. So if I'm a, if I'm a RITDB client, 
I have my own private channel and I must subscribe to my private channel. Why? Because someone wants to talk to me, they need to know who to talk to. So I want to talk to a specific piece of equipment. I would talk to their private channel. So there's, you know, uh, arbitration back and forth to say, yes, I'm going to allow you to connect to me. And once you've connected to me, we can communicate privately. Versus some of these other channels, say the node admin, which is a general channel that every client connects to, is the way for me to talk to the node. In this case, it's that whoever is sitting on the test cell, so I'm talking to that node. You listen to the node client. There's some things we'll talk about later, but for example, in RITDB, we do a ping, and every source that's connected to the system must subscribe to the node admin and on the node admin it gets a request for a ping and it responds for information about itself basically so you kind of always know hey I'm, I'm connected and here's my info there's events topic so the events topic so the events topic here the second one down below this is where we would send out events lot start lot in program load, program unload, those kinds of things, or even test start, test stop, you know, all of the event messages that we have that describe what, what is happening in the test cell. So it's what's happening right now. Oh, I just started to test the part, right? Um, you can actually go as low or as high as you want. You know, in one of our implementations, we had the capability to actually um, send an event that recorded that a test function started and stopped. Of course, we don't do that in production, but it does make it really nice if you're looking at that from an engineering point of view. There's the action. So here we've got this action which allows us to do something. Uh, in this case, um, an action could be used to push an object into the metadata index repository or to pull an object from the metadata index repository. And then we've got here the data log. So you notice here in the data log, it's a separate channel. The reason we separated data log stream from event stream is it's very large. And you don't want to have to subscribe to something and have this huge subscription. Hey, if I want data log, I'm going to subscribe just to data log. If I want events, I want to go and subscribe to just events. I don't want it clogged up with data, right? So we had a different channel for data log. And the beauty of this, which will talk more about, um, I think, in the client version, is we send in what we call windows. So we send data um, in chunks. So you, our initial implementation, we sent it at every touchdown, and then we built it into a window and pushed the window of multiple touchdowns into the repository. It's completely under your control. You could do it at a lower level if you wanted. But for our implementation, per touchdown was enough for production. And so here you've got the information in the topic that kind of helps you understand, well, what is the, the window that I'm pushing or, or that I'm sending out? And then there's some attributes that are, you know, part of this message which tell me exactly what the data log is about. Right? So, again, it's a different stream because we wanted people to be able to um, separately decide which topics to uh, subscribe to. So there's a real art to figuring out the topic structure to give not too fine a grain on every topic, but not too much that you have to subscribe to a lot just to throw it away, right? So this has been the challenge or what we've been trying to work on in the POC to identify the kind of the balance of the topics to provide to the customers. So here's the proof of concept, or completed or in work. These are the different proof of concepts that we've done. So the first one here you'll see is data log. We did wafer, unit, and strip. We still need a little bit more work with strip to, to get that all worked out, because that kind of requires us to have, um, actually, it's just a little bit of a what translator translator work because we we take the data for these POCs we take the data as it comes from the tester and we write a translator which converts it into RITDB standard that allows us to use legacy but produce standard on the other side okay equipment log dot tester equipment log dot tester we created a container across more than 10 platforms in TI, we implemented a process to send the e-log via RITDB message, and then we updated the spec to include more details. So, um, and, and this was in partnership with Teradyne when they were working on the Thames 
standard so that we could, end, you know, kind of align Thames and Written Me together and say what additional information. Um, in that case, what we added is a lot more software detail all the way down to, uh, I guess, the, uh, <laughs> I guess you could say the build of Windows, for example. We got all the way down into what build was installed on the tester um, in order to help you debug certain problems. So all of that highly detailed software information or information about the boards and what's in the boards, et cetera, is able to be stored within the equipment log tester. Um, events, so we created the event container, validated the spec, implemented streaming events and support for archiving the stream into the RITDB container and implemented a process to create and publish derived events. So we have something we call a rule engine. It takes in the facts from the tester and produces calculated or derived events that can then be subscribed to by some other application. Um, th this could be, well, I won't get into examples, probably say something I shouldn't, but there, there's a lot of neat things here that you can do with um, these derived event generations. And then genealogy, we created a process to capture and store lot transitions. So this is lot moves, lot splits, lot combines, how to take that and move that so that we could utilize that during test, right? Um, because we wanted to be able to track what was going on with the lots in addition to just the die ID. Okay. What other planned POCs do we have? So these are things that we would like to do as um, part of the task force. We have E142. We'd like to actually implement that. We've done a lot of studies making sure we could do it. We haven't implemented yet. PCM, so wafer acceptance testing, end of line. I've evaluated it and I've thought through how would I integrate parametric tests into um, RITDB, and I have done a lot of work on this, so you know, I, in the past, did have responsibility for grabbing parametric data and putting it into TI's ecosystem, so I'm quite familiar with parametric data in addition to probe and final. And um, I've thought through how it would be done, and, and I don't see any issue with it. I just haven't had time to do the proof of concept. Um, system level test, validate proper collection of information and data that can be streamed and populated into a RITDB container. System level test creates a lot of unique um, issues with collecting data. And so we've thought about those, but we haven't really quite done the SLT yet. So there's a lot of challenges here that need to be addressed because of the uniqueness of the, some of the SLT environments. Equipment log other. Um, one of the things we want to do is look at two equipment log use cases. One is equipment log .handler to record the detail of what's in the handler at time of test. And this could be um, a lot about the recipe, the handler settings, the software, et cetera. And then equipment log .test cell. This would be more to capture the full stack of what's in the test cell. You, um, today, you, you have portions of this within the data log stream. You have a list of kind of the load board and some basic stuff, and you have the detailed part about the tester, but you don't have the rest of what's in the test cell. Is there a a thermal stream in the test cell? Is there a laser in the test cell? You, you don't have the other information that tells you everything that makes up the test cell. You don't have information about, say, custom customers test cell software, control software. What is it? What version is it? You know, none of that stuff is available and it really doesn't belong in the data log. I should be able to collect it and have the data log reference it. I shouldn't need to clog up my data log with that kind of environmental information. Next thing is large digital test. We have uh, a lot of conversation going on on how to deal with large digital tests. This is scan data, pattern data, and different test conditions. There's a lot of changes in scan data and some unique, I guess, how do you see, adaptive scan kind of things that are going on or, you know, where you, we need to figure out the best way to collect this data. And we have participation from some of the ATE vendors to try to help identify this. 
AM, uh, AI and ML structures. You know, how, what do we do to collect information about the operational control, device level control, tracking decisions and conditions of the device, right? Um, we need more than just what's the response from the algorithm. <laughs> You know, what were the inputs to the algorithm? Could we recreate it? How do we debug if there's a problem? You know, I mean, it can't just be a pure black box if we're going to be able to figure out what's going on on the test cell when this AI algorithm is running. Okay. And then reverse tracking. We, we want to do some things to make sure that we can um, track the device or part history through the system. So some of the things we've done, um, just kind of FYI in the, the system, we have reflectors. So one of the ways that you integrate your legacy equipment into RITDB is you build a reflector. And basically what that does is it takes arbitrary IoT message input and translates that into RITDB output. So what you do is you, let's say, monitor a file. You take every file change that happens. You send that out as a basic RITDB message. You agree on some custom topic, and you put the body of the message in binary form, but it's whatever the native com content is. Then you send it out. You have a reflector watch that topic. It takes that topic, converts it with some kind of logic into a standard RITDB message, and pushes it out the other side. Now you have standard RITDB on the other side, but you've taken advantage of whatever your legacy equipment can already produce. Right. This is the way we've done a lot of things to try to integrate RITDB and build a standard system on the other side that we can put applications on top of, independent of the fact that it's legacy equipment and doesn't have the capability natively. The next thing is importers. So we've built importers that allow us to do bulk imports into the MDIR and real-time imports. So, it, for example, we can... Um, extract data from a database as updates to the database happen and convert those into RITDB messages. So now I have taken an existing system which has information and translated those into events that I can now use in a RITDB system. So this is really useful for a lot of existing legacy systems there. I need the information to act upon it, but it's not in a form that allows me to do something with it. And then exporters. How do I go from RITDB to external systems? Can I export from RITDB into a database or into some big data system or whatever it is to support my existing systems to push data to those so that they can make use of whatever I'm doing within RITDB. And again, I guess I should notice that we, we use reflectors quite a lot to repair data. Um, so th this gives us an opportunity to clean up data where we can do checks and say, oh, that's bad information. I know that's wrong. I can fix it before it goes to the next application. So some of the user applications that we have built, we've got a STDF to RITDB converter that's available, the, if you guys want, that um, also has the source code in it, so that you can take a look at the source code. So you've got STDF to RITDB. We've got the spec validator that's available so that you can validate that the output RITDB that you're producing is available. We have a query tool that allows you to query the RITDB. It's got some predefined queries in it that allow you to kind of look at the content of the data, and there's a data viewer that's available. We've done some uh, tester inventory monitors and tester board tracking. So these are some of the POCs that we did that allowed us to collect, remember those equipment log testers, we collect those into a system and we can monitor those for changes. Oh, there's a board change. This board was swapped out. Is this board being swapped out too much? Why is this board failing? You know, is it related to a program? And then once we find that a particular program is responsible or always loaded, and after that the board fails, we can go look to see if there are program problems. Maybe somebody is, you know, not handling a relay properly, for example, or they're stressing something on the board and not handling their power up properly. And so this is causing the boards to go bad, right? So there's lots of things you can do with inventory data. It seems boring, but it actually can be quite useful for you to study and, and look at. Okay. 
Data visualization. We've done some data monitoring of data logs, wafer maps, spin maps, and um, status. We've looked at equipment status. So remember I told you we can do the ping. Well, with that ping, I can go do a ping, and then I can do a little report that shows me what's the status of all my testers right now, right? Or I could go ask it by doing a query of the MDIR, what version of software blah is on the tester right now, right? Um, history versus current, so I can look at what's the current status and what was the history uh, of the data. So here, for example, so here's a little chart shows you kind of, this is the kind of boring in this form, but it's a rolling chart. So as events are coming in on a tester, this is updating, and you'll see the green is really um, utilization. Um, how do you say, productive time in OEE, the blue dots are giving me some markers that tell me certain things happen at that point. So um, it could be lot start or program load, you know, th those are the kind of things we put the markers on. The gray is idle time, so nothing's going on on the tester at that point in time. And then we've got some different other markers, like the red markers, something bad happened. Let's say maybe the handler stopped and it shouldn't be, that kind of thing. And so this is a scrolling or rolling monitor that has some window of time and it scrolls over. So you could put this up on the board, you can easily see the status of the tester. And then we have this collective OEE data at the bottom where you can set a threshold for what do you expect your utilization to be. And if it gets above that, it's green, in the middle it's yellow, and if it's below that, it's red, it means, hey, I've got some problem on my testers. So we have uh, did a demo of this to kind of show what the utilization of this would look like so we could look across the different testers. And just kind of FYI, you can right click on one of these markers and then it gives you all the data about the marker. Um, the other thing that we're working on on this one is sending out alerts and with the alert, we give you the data so that you can go look at the alert and then you can look at whatever happened around the alert. So in other words, yeah, X, Y happened on the tester, but you get along with it the information you need to look at the real-time history. And guess what? I can go replay, because we'll see that next, replay the data and look at it and sell it real time and watch what's happening up to the point the alert happened. So again, we can replay history in real time. And the huge benefit is that I can now develop real-time applications offline using real data. So I've collected this real-time data. I go back and I get my different use cases of different things that happen. I capture them and I can go build my application. Let's say I want to tweak my application. Well, I can go in, tweak my application, release it, use this replay engine, and see what impact it would have had on the floor if I changed my thresholds. Right? So the replay engine is really useful. And which is why, remember we said we want all of the data? <laughs> Right? If I'm coming back in here, I want all of the data. If I go do the replay, I want to replay it based on everything, not just a decision that was made, because then maybe I want to go change the way I make that decision. The only way that I can figure out how I should do a better job of making a decision is to have all the inputs available to me to replay. There's a rules engine. So here we built a little rules engine that processes and monitors the events and the data to produce notifications and alarms in real time. So I'm monitoring this, so I'm gonna look at the data. I can look at different streams together. So I can look at my event stream and my data log stream. I can look at the um, admin events that tell me how the tester's doing, et cetera, and combine them all together to produce some kind of notification or alert. I am not limited to one type of data, right? I'm, I can take the interactions of those data and use those to determine alerts and alarms. So again, the multiple streams are being used to look at the data. So, hey, maybe I'm monitoring the client behavior and I see a spike in the number of events now I can go in and look at the other streams to figure out, well, why all of a sudden when I'm normally getting 50 events, you know, a minute, I get 500 events in a minute. What the hell happened on my tester, right? Now I can go back and try to figure out, well, why did I get that spike of events? What happened? What changed in the system? It's really difficult to do that today. Even TI has a very rich event system, but 
it all gets stuck in Oracle and you want to go back and look at the history, it's just not very efficient, right? It's not designed to be a temporal database and you, you need something that's time-based if you're going to look at events. So, and I think part of the challenge of uh, smart manufacturing, at, at least at test, is how do I merge batched data with time data and do it easily and quickly, right? Which is what we've been experimenting with, how to make that happen. And then ATA, ATE clients. So we have developed uh, three types of clients. We have a Java client on the tester, we have a C++ client on the tester, and we've created a Python client that go on the tester. So, um, you know, you can do it in all kinds of languages. You just need MQTT and, um, you know, something that will run on your platform. Um, so, in, and of course, in some cases, some have more, are more performance, um, will give you better performance. But in some cases, hey, if I'm dealing with a legacy, something is better than nothing. And, you know, hey, if I've got a delay in some of my responses, it's still closer to real time than what I have, right? So, and Python was really easy to do, right? Now, keep in mind, there are some really clever ways to do it and not so clever ways to do it, but it's, you know, a language that a lot of people are comfortable with, particularly engineers on the floor. So it gives them a way to, to innovate different ways of utilizing that client. So we built our own whole library that gives them the functions and they can just go off and create. They don't have to worry about how to interface with the system. So some of the applications needed, I'll just go through this really quickly. We want to do SLT. We want to check out bench testing. I think we can, RITDB can really help people with bench testing. It's a very standard format. It's queryable, et cetera. It can handle all the conditions, adaptive test, you name it. Um, could be very helpful. Cell topology. We need to look at, you know, how do we make sure that all the RITDB, the the machine to machine, and all that kind of stuff. How do we manage that along with security? Scaling data analysis. Right. Well, how we go from the edge to to um, kind of a bigger data lake. Uh, failure recovery and updates. You know, we're we're looking at doing some auto updates, meaning we can via messaging we can push out a client update. And if it doesn't work, we can easily push out a message that gives you the previous version. So we're looking at that not only for ReadyB clients, but how to do that with any software on the test cell. Now I've got a much smarter way of dealing with software versions um, that could really help operationally to manage software versions, at least at a minimum, those guys in the lab who have this variety of tester versions that they have to deal with. Uh, security and encryption, do more work on security and, and encryption. Big digital, AI, ML, robot integration and cloud integration. So these are areas we've played with, but we haven't done real POCs yet in terms of actually exercising them in any detail. So these are the future POCs that we're looking at. Intersecting with sex gym. This is one um, that, that we're not quite sure how to do yet, and we haven't really um, figured out, but at a minimum, we can do a mapping between sex gym and RITDB and have an on-equipment RITDB connection that can communicate within the machine, and then the client on the machine would dictate what gets published to RITDB. The, the problem is we can't really sniff the factory host because it's a private connection. It's a single private connection, so I can't really sniff it. So, um, which is what we've done a lot on the test cell. We've sniffed connections or whatever we can see, we've grabbed it and converted it to RITDB. We, we're not quite sure how we would do that with SexGym at this point, um, although I, I can see there's information that we really should share between SexGym and RITDB. So th this is what um, we're proposing as the one solution that we know we could handle. And the, the idea is, is there a better way to do that? Um, we, we would love to hear it. So what are the benefits of ROI of RITDB integration? Just kind of want to show you. So RITDB infrastructure, I think one of the biggest benefits, it enables small improvements in a consistent, efficient way, right? There's lots of small things that need to happen to improve operationally or to make changes. Um, and there's no one big giant thing that's going to make 
everything better. I think it's a lot of little things that make things better. Capacity improvements, reduce latency and improve response time, real-time optimization of material delivery. Right? Hey, I'm going to finish an hour early. You can bring me my lot now, for example. Um, hey, I'm not going to be done. I'm an hour behind on my setup. So if another tester can handle that lot, please deliver it to them. You know, um, capital reduction. You know, if we can improve utilization, then and, and we can improve predict predictive maintenance on the equipment, all the way down from tester, all the way down to socket or probe card, then we can reduce uh, capital uh, quality. You know, real-time outlier uh, detection, putting things, uh, an edge appliance on the tester and being able to do, um, you know, reduce test time or do test optimization. So a lot of little areas that we can improve that will make a big change uh, on the floor. And I, I think the other thing that's often we're missing is often people have these really great innovative ideas but they're stuck because the infrastructure can't support them. And before they can do their really great idea, they have to first get the infrastructure in place. And I believe that if we can build something where RITDB infrastructure is in place, we reduce that barrier and people's innovations come to life faster. And I think that they, that can be a huge benefit for any company that puts something like this in place. Again, remember, it was the democratization of the data. Um, I don't want to have to go through IT to do an innovation on a test floor, right? I, I, you know, make sure my infrastructure's there, make sure it's up and running, make sure I have network bandwidth. That's your job, everything else I should be able to do, right? And the idea is how do I minimize their need to help me make my innovations happen? So the next steps for RITDB standards we talked about is the event message standardization. We've done a lot of work and I think we've got most of this worked out and really the, where we're at is just documenting <laughs> the standard in a way that's you know, gonna be useful for people and validatable. That's really, we haven't quite figured out how to do that quite yet. And then cross domain data exchange. How do we share data uh, between domains? And I believe then the next big question here is, where should we go next? If you guys have ideas of something that we're missing in the RITDB task force or where we're not addressing, then the next big question is, well, what should it be? You know, what are the gaps that we're not seeing that we need to address, right? So the idea is that, hey, if you don't want to be part of the task force, great, but you can always give us pointers on what the task force should address in order to make the test cell environment more useful, better, and integrate it into a smart factory. Okay. That's the end of my overview. So you mentioned uh, bringing e-test data in parametric. Has there been exploration of metrology data in line actual fab data coming through RITDB also? Or is this just sticking to the electrical side? I have not looked at metrology data, but I don't see any reason why it wouldn't fit into the RITDB container. And it would include inline and end of line electrical because those are really not that different. Um, but in terms of metrology, Based on the integration I did 10, 12 years ago when I did PDF data power, I don't see any reason we couldn't fit it in. Uh, all of the information you need about location is there. I think we just need a few attributes which are more of a um, physical location versus coordinate location. And that's something that I would do for parametric or end of line electrical anyway. Because I think the fact that we rely on coordinates for everything uh, uh, li limits our ability to analyze data across the whole fab, right? We should have vector information about physically where we are um, when we're testing a particular component within uh, the scribe structure. Yeah, any, any other questions? Yes. 
So you had mentioned uh, something about going from a previous insertion and grabbing the data. So have you seen any test time impacts that you've observed because of grabbing the data or how long does it take to grab that data? Yeah, the, the way we did that uh, specifically, well, you mean within a run, within a run. Um, no, we've, we've only really looked at the ability to do it, not implementing it specifically, so I couldn't tell you, but the, Mark, how long does it take to do a query? I can show you some stuff, but uh, typically a query of a running lot's about 10 to 12 milliseconds to get like a worksheet view. I can show, I'll show you some of that in the, in the example. Yeah, so I guess if depending our, on actually our, your our test goal, we, time constraints. Yeah, yeah. One of the tests we actually did early was real-time DPAT. Yeah. So what we wanted to do was move DPAT out of the test plan and, and into the external. Uh, one of the guys that worked with us did uh, took, I think, 200 tests and did a 50-part DPAT on it. And we were able to turn it around by the, by the binning time. So it was about 12 milliseconds. Uh, it doesn't block, right? So the way, it, well, it depends on your tester, you know. How <laughs> uh, he said, it. but the the test that we actually do that our tester streams the data out continuously to a. So what we do is, as Stacy said, as the data comes out, it goes to a local database cache, which is on disk. That cache is what's interrogated, so that's being dynamically generated, and the event comes back asynchronously. And so the goal would be to get the binning information back before the end of test. And, you know, that's not a particularly challenge. You know, we can, we usually have a lot of time to turn that around. But our goal is to do per test responses. But we want to, we want to respond to a single test. Other questions? Any work on encrypting, partial encryption, record-oriented encryption? Oh, yes. Yeah, and one of the things that we do in RITDB that's, that doesn't come out a lot in, in the way it, it looks is there's no requirement that there be a single result file. And so as we generate this result, say customer A gets, can get their own data encrypted by customer A. At the same time, customer B can get data encrypted for customer B. And it's a little hard to do inserted encryption. And there is an encrypted database, but you tend to get the whole thing encrypted. Now, you could do some of this home iconic stuff and try and do something funny. But what we decided to do is to allow the, um, the file to be split with different data for different users and, and different encryption for each file. So that it's per file encryption keys and stuff. We use this public private key set in order to you know, exchange a key. So like if you were running stuff at a subcon and you want your specific data filtered out, encrypted, and sent to you, there's no way for the subcon to actually have the, the decryption key, right, because it's end-to-end. -end. So we've taken a more of a, we did a lot of defense work early on that, that drove us to this. One of the other things we, we see is futzing the data before it's sent out, right? So we'll actually take the data, uh, do all the binning information, do that, and then futz the data before we save it so there's no real data kept, right? And so there's enough data to sort of give you an idea of the statistics, but there's not enough data to tell you how the binning worked. So, you know, these are, we have to support this. So we've been, we've gone with a flexible support idea. Real-time streaming encryption, you know, you can use TLS and stuff, but you know, it's, it's, when you're on a test floor, you want to be careful that you don't start making it too messy. I think encrypting stream is satisfactory for that. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and so the way the metadata works is we have this concept of part of, and so when you're actually generating, as Stacy said, there's windows. The windows don't have to be all of the data, and there doesn't have to be one in window per time step, right? And so the way we would deal, especially there's stuff where you've got money involved, right, keys as referred to credit cards and stuff, there's absolutely no reason why we can't stream that to a separate topic that's encrypted separately, containerized separately, and that container can be encrypted again for the target. So all of our, sorry, all of our encryptions are for the target. They're not local encryptions. They're always intended for the destination. It's a little bit different approach, but uh, it's pretty pragmatic. If you have any, uh, we're always looking for inputs on that too, because we're trying to figure out you know, just how people want to, we need to have an easy way to split it and recombine it essentially. 
One of the things Stacy didn't mention is that um, because this is a database and it's not a linear file, we don't have restrictions on when we put this stuff into the file. So STDF, we have to put it in there when we have it. And this thing, we can put it in when we have it. You know, we can put it in post-process, we can take it out, we can move it around. This entire metadata in index repository is actually immutable. So there is actually no, the whole thing's indexed by hashes. So there's absolutely no way to edit a file without losing it. And so our goal here is, is ultimate traceability. There's no way to fix the file without generating a fork, essentially. Any other things? Any, okay, thank you. So probably from listening to Stacy, you figure out this was a, a well-tuned product ready to be purchased for a few dollars. Um, all nicely cohesive and working together, done by thousands of people. But it really wasn't. But when we decided to do uh, 10 years ago, when we started on the STDF update, one of the things that we decided that we were going to do is not have a standard that hadn't been tested. And so for everything we did, somebody did a test case. So we had some people did an E142 test case. We had, a, I did a, the, we had two of us did a translator, some other people done. So everything here has actually been tried before we actually did this back. So what you're actually seeing that Stacy's talking about and that we've tried in the POCs is actually the contribution of lots of people. And our goal was to have an infrastructure that, that made it easy to do these apps, right? We, we don't want a thousand person project. There's not enough money to pay for that. What we want is a, an infrastructure that allows your average uh, test engineer or some other type of person running the floor to actually um, make their own apps or generate their own data. So I'm going to take a few minutes here and just walk through. I'm going to show you some technical uh, details. But we actually also did a JavaScript, cl JavaScript client. So we actually have a browser version. We, we're running this in Node as well. Um, that's quite slow, but it does work. What I want to show you here, this is a, a, a translated STDF file. I wanted to just really show you the, the things that Stacy's talking about. Um, one of the things you get from the translator for free uh, is, not on this one, but you have an option where you can actually get the STDF file as 20 different tables, right? So one of the things you can do with the translator is when you read your STDF file, you can see it as PTRs and all that. This would be the traditional approach that people wanted to do. But what we found when we tried to do that, we could not control the table structures adequately. People wanted to add options. They wanted to do different things. Some work was done by um, Stephen Eichelberger, at, in, I think he was at Infineon at the time, or perhaps in XP, where he used SQLite as the data transport format rather than something else. And so that looked like a good idea. He was doing SQLite and turning it into XML, which didn't look like as interesting an idea. But what we did is we, we grabbed SQLite, and it has a particular feature that most databases don't have is that the columns can be data typeless. So I can put any type in, I have a column, I can have a float in it, an integer, a string, whatever. So there's, so a lot of people don't like that, but for data transport, it turns out it makes the database much more uh, consistent. And so as we started doing it, we said, well, what do we need in data transport for, or data manipulation? The leftmost column is that one of the key things is time. The only thing, one of the things that we do know as we take data is we know the time we took it. We also have to know the location we took it at as well. So we can, by using time in place, we can actually fix a lot of bugs, a lot of problems, a lot of mistakes that people made, because we can align these things in time and we can determine where they were done. So the first time actually gives us um, time resolution. It's actually UTC time. It's bumped up by a million, so we have microsecond type timing. Uh, but that's a key thing is what we call sequence. The next two objects are really, or the two columns are just integers, they're object pointers. You know, so what we ended up, this is really a serialization format. And it's an object-oriented serialization format. There's nothing particularly novel about it. But as we looked at STDF, we decided we needed a two-dimensional format. So a lot of times we're doing two-dimensional grids. And so in order, again, to make this data, we could have done less, but um, we did a lot of testing. We're about, if you have a poorly written STDF file, which is a typical STDF file, our size is about the same. Uh, but we can carry way more data, so we end up being bigger when we're done. So there's a two-dimensional, the entity ID and the index ID. And entity ID is an object reference. Index ID is a secondary object reference. This allows us to do a 2D table. Uh, we have a name of an attribute. Of course, you need names. 
Uh, that's a string, and um, we have a value, and the value can be anything. Stacy pointed out the result, but that value could be an image, it could be a vector, it could be any kind of. We went with Seabor for the encoding because we wanted a tight, self-describing encoding scheme that was lightweight. And it turns out Seabor just happens to. You know, a lot of people want to use JSON or text or that or XML. It, you know, we're we're machines talking to machines, doing computations on it. So we went with Seabor. Uh, the, the final column, as we were playing with this, we realized we needed flags. We, you know, we, we, data always has a condition. How do I carry a null? How do I carry it incomplete? How do I carry an uncertainty? So that's a, a flag column that allows us to uh, tag the data. And so with, with just that simple thing, these six columns, we're now able to, all of the stuff that you've seen Stacey talk about is all in this same table. Now, the other nice thing about this is when we write the validator, we just take another SQL-like database, attach them, and run some queries on it. So the validation is basically machine-driven. The standard, this is probably the first standard that actually is a SQL-like database as the standard. So it's a machine-readable standard as compared to a, a person-readable one. I'm just going to show you a couple quick things here. Uh, turns out in this particular file, the, um, the first entity is, is what we would have called the MIR information. And this, um, the tool I'm using here is DB Browser. It's an off-the-shelf thing. It's nothing special. And this is actually looking at a RedDB file. So here, by just forcing the, the first entity there, I get the run info. And there you can see all the attributes that you, a lot of the attributes that you would normally see in an MIR. Uh, Stacy mentioned the infamous R. That's a fairly large table. Um, and so if we, most, normally we would see the index ID as zero, but here we have 41 for the index ID that points at the test and this 16 points to the, um, uh, the actual in, the instance of the of the device. So if I take and enter my 41 in here, now what I see is all my results data. And one of the things I can do with this is I can view a plot. So I can just pick, say, the sequence here and the value here. and give it a chance here to go through its 50 million parts. And this is just going to plot the result data, I hope. <sighs> Imagine that it works quickly. So normally this takes about, the, there it goes. Yeah, there's a few parts in here, and they're all random. So just with a standard off-the-shelf database, I can actually go and look at this particular test and, and actually plot it directly. So you can basically, just using SQL, do everything you can, you can imagine to this particular data type. And so to do a quickie, I'm not going to go through and type through a million things, but we do also have a, um, a tool that, that's available off the web. This is our little translator tool. Uh, the translator tool, tool can, it does a bunch of things. It create, it takes uh, SQL files and you can convert them to a DB files. You can index them, which makes them a little bit faster to access. You can make a wide table. But over here in options are a bunch of tools that different people have done. One of the things, what we call the tuple query tool. Um, we were playing around, we decided it, we didn't, writing SQL like this is sort of difficult for us. We're not SQL people. So instead we actually wrote a um, data log type language. This is more like prologue. It allows you to do a pattern match type definition of what you want to see. So here on the left, we have rules and we have tuples. You can then convert that to SQL. That's what the SQL would look like. And then you can query it on a database and that's what the query looks like. So this is basically going through and querying that same database fairly quickly, but you can, you can just bounce through and see def different things. Like we could see all the result. This is the result info, which tells you the name of the test and the units. Uh, there's entity types, uh, that. and so with this tool, you can actually see what the SQL would look like to do the various things. Again, trying to give you an idea that it's it's pretty easy to do. 
Another interesting thing that you can actually do is, you, as Stacy said, you can actually build a script into the tool. This is, a, a, again, in that data log type language. You can actually build a script that goes with the data that a person then can then run and actually see that data in the way you wanted them to see it. So this thing was just running a query on that data that was defined by that script. All of this code is basically doing queries and just pumping them into, into grid panes, you know, Java type grid panes or stuff. There's, there's probably, a, this particular thing was a few hundred lines of code to actually do this, this example. And you know, you were asking here, I am scrolling it. This is 65,000 parts, and I, I'm just, each of these, each movement is a full query. So we're actually, uh, the queries run around 10, 12 milliseconds. One last thing I'd like to show here is um, these, the event stuff. So the first thing we did and that, what I just showed you is we did containers. The idea of a container, in fact, you can see if I uh, pop open the, there's, there's a little viewer here that looks like the MDIR. So what happens in, in our Indus repository is we've effectively already sharded the data. You know, a big thing when we're doing big data stuff is we want to split the stuff into chunks so we can send it to different places. In the back end, we don't have big chunks, right? We have batches, we have lots, we have sublots, we have test steps. And so what we have in the back end is a lot of places where the data stop, where the parts stop, some data is taken, it, something else happens, some data is taken, something else happens. And so what we wanna do, we can't, we want, don't wanna put that in a big database, we don't wanna keep it all in one big giant file. So what instead is each file ends up getting tagged by these, um, this metadata. And you can see there's quite a bit of different stuff over here. There's like the test or the facility, the system ID. There's also some stuff in there, but it's all hashed and, and it can all be encrypted. So basically, by just reading the metadata here, we can decide what data we want to look at. And so if I've got a problem, say as Stacy said, we're doing this reverse tracking. If I'm, if I'm Amazon or something, I can run a million cores for a couple hours and look for some data across my petabytes of data. But typically, we don't have that problem in the test floor. As we said earlier, most of the data is local. Most of the dat batches are in 10,000 parts or so. We know about what time we're worried about because remember, we kept the time. So we can actually subset the data down to maybe 50 or 100 files. In fact, what we did for this board tracking is we'll look at the last six months, which is maybe 18,000 um, inventories. And in about 40 seconds, we can actually pull out all the moves that happened in those six months. And, and it's because everything's already sharded. So we're not looking at big giant, we're not looking at big data, we're looking at a lot of chunks of small data. This also allows us to do a lot of processing locally. We can get the history on the test floor without running big data in the factory. So if we look at some of this, again, the nice thing about a lot of this stuff is it's, um, here's events. You know, I can add a filter, oops, sorry. So what this does is this is all the data, all the things that were data logs. And here you can see we can just, because they're all RIPDB, we can use a standard viewing tool to just convert this into a tree view. Each of these instances is a, uh, an object entity. And as I click on this arrow, if I can see it. Should open up here in a second. I can actually go through there and, and see them all as sequ as uh, as just standard views. Hmm. I've obviously hung something up. There we go. So I can convert this to SQL instead, and we can see the SQL table. So all of this is again is being done with SQL. The last thing I have here is uh, the events. Um, First, I'll just show you what an event looks like so we can all see it. So one of the, some of the stuff we have, we have a little message tool here. This allows us to, uh, for instance, we can send a, send a ping here. And I send the message and we get the responses back. 
So one, another thing we did that we didn't talk about much in Stacy's thing, but we did in the standard is we limit the number of, not only do we have CBOR, but we limit the number of options you have for encoding the regular things. So you can think of it in our case, everything is either a map, it's a database, or it's an array. And so that's the bodies of, of the thing. So you can see here, this is a map. Uh, this was a message up here. Uh, it's a connect message, and you can see it's a, it's a named ordered map is what we use. So each map has a name and here it's connect and here's all the attributes about this connection. What this allows me to do is by, I can have this little props viewer. If I click on this, this shows me everything that's currently connected. And as I click on them, it's actually querying all the setup information and down below is all of the, um, the current status, like how many messages it's doing and stuff like that. Again, this is all handled by sending events out. As Stacey will talk a little bit later, we have this thing called a node admin event, which you can see here, that everybody has to respond to. Now, I'm not gonna get a lot into the, um, the topic structure. You can argue forever on topics. Uh, at Roost, we did some stuff several years ago trying to, to solve this messaging problem. We used a lot of this here. The problem we have is that most IoT systems are flat. You know, there's, there's a broker and there's a thousand, hundred thousand clients. Most test floors are hierarchical. We have cells, we have floors, we have factories, we have that. We had, we had to come up with a structure that allows us, if we get a message for somebody, we have to be able to send a message back to that somebody. And so if you look at the topic closely, the first thing is the private address. So that's the private address of the person that sent you that message. So whenever you get a message, you actually, you know where it came from, which allows us to validate it, because we don't want anybody telling a tester to stop. But it also tells you that you can send something back to that person and know that it went directly back to the person that sourced it. So there has to be some tweaky, there's some magic in there that allows us to go across facilities. Uh, it's interesting, Stacy can sit in her office in Dallas and watch what's going on in Malaysia. Uh, you know, for those people that don't like their bosses looking over the shoulder, this is not a good solution. Um, you can peek on everything that's going on and you can actually see exactly what's happening. So, you know, these are the events. Now if I'm gonna run this little applet. So all of this app is doing is, is sending queries um, to, to the, the replay, right? Now for those of you that thought that was nice and fast, that's about 10,000 times real time. You know, normally on a floor, it's like watching paint dry. You know, we get a couple messages per second. <laughs> With the replay thing, in this case, we can act, this is playing about eight hours. We just played back eight hours of time. And, and this is, one of our guys is playing around. This is a, a consultant that, that's worked uh, for quite a few years on the STDF stuff. He's trying to do, well, how do you represent what's going on on the floor? You can't see it on this one, but we've had situations where we could actually see when lunch occurred because you know the whole floor stops <laughs> and then starts up again. Uh, you, you can ask your questions on this thing. What happened, you know, in this, everybody went red for a while. You know, what happened at that period of time? And so, you know, this little four little colors, but you can actually click on this tester, for instance, and we can see, well, hmm, we have all, this has all kinds of tester information. We can see what the CPU loading on that tester was like. And we can start lining this stuff up because remember we have, even though this is, this is information that's being gathered from those pings, we can query it and align it with everything else because we have time. So I can look at that. I can probably look down here at, uh, oh, it's anything interesting, uh, message count. Oh, here's interesting. This is the number of messages it's generating. You can see it's been pretty busy and then it sort of goes to not doing much. This is typically what you see when there's a handler problem because it's just sitting here cycling saying I'm, I'm, I need stuff, I need stuff, I need stuff. And so what you see is a low message count. When it's actually running, you'll see a relatively high message count. And when it's messed up, you'll see a really high message count sometimes. So, you know, and the interesting thing about all this stuff, as Stacy mentioned, the rule, we had, the rule thing we did was a really simple AI. You know, back in the 80s or maybe earlier, they did expert systems. The big thing we were gonna use was an expert system. We went ahead and took an expert, that same expert system and applied it to this. So what this does is it allows your test engineers to augment the rules. They can basically write their own rules. They can say, send me an email when I see this situation. That rule thing has visibility of the entire floor. 
In fact, it has invisibility. It could have visibility of your entire company. And so all of a sudden you have, watching this stuff, as I say, watching paint dry is pretty boring. But when you get an email, when, every, when three testers go out or when your lot's finished, uh, one of the things for a lot of people is they like to know where their stuff is. We have a, a little rule thing that this is where's my stuff. And it tells you when your stuff gets to a particular step. Uh, we have things that watch the yield. I mean, all of this stuff, but none of this stuff requires us to do anything. The rule thing, again, it's just SQL and some logic, compare logic. So the goal is, again, not to require a professional organization to do this. It's the democratization thing. The standard tells you what the infrastructure is. We want you to do all your own stuff. I think that's probably good. We can go to the... Our people can ask questions at this point while we set up for uh, Stacy's finale. Is there anything in the chat? No? Okay. Now, one of the things we do plan to do is have some follow-up webinars, and in that case, we will offer something more like an implementation um, overview, that is, how do you actually implement the client with example code and source code that you can use. Yeah. So we we will follow up with some of those and any of those that are interested let us know and we'll make sure that you get notified when we when we do a smart test or seven versus smart test eight kind of implementation that you could pull into Adventist. Yes. The data one is available tonight. And then the. Much easier, right? Yeah. Right. So, Ruse Instruments did the Java. Adventist did a C one. And then we and TI did Python for some legacy stuff. But like I said, we, what we did is we uh, provided some example source code and worked directly with them to help them understand the standard. Um, and of course, the STDF to TF has some source code in it, so it really helps in terms of just FYI, the first step, can you produce a container that's correct? It's always the first thing we tell them. Before you get into events, et cetera, can you produce an appropriate container? Because the events has a whole bunch of other stuff that comes on top of it that it, it's easier to understand if you already understand a RITDB container and how it works. Going back, yeah. Yes. Yeah, even if you don't have STDF, it's a, it's a, I, I mean, even though, you know, studying the STDF to RITDB tool gives you a lot of insight on how to do your own as well. Because a lot of the, the pieces in the source code that produce the RITDB objects are the same. The key difference is where do you get the data from to fill the object, right? Oh, if I know I have result information, what is the test? I'm going to go look at what, you, what did you do with the PTR data and where did you put it? Oh, I know I got limits. So what did you do with the limits in the PTR and where did it go? Okay, now I know what to do with it. What did I do with the result? I go look at the PTR. What did I do with site information? Well, look at the SDR. It, it's very similar. Yes. Yeah. Oh, the sorry. The question was, if you have, if you don't have STDF, how do I go about converting into RITDB? And my answer is, the STDF to RITDB gives you almost all the clues you need from a data log point of view. Now, if you're looking at other types of data, um, then we would want to work out you. Um, Let's say Diag data. We have the Diag format. We don't really have an example for you, but it's very similar. I mean, it really comes down to the um, level of the data. 
you have to make a decision of the level of the data. And that's really what seems to be different, say, about end of line electrical versus pro versus final test, is what tells me definitively what part I'm testing. And that has an impact on the population of the information about the part. And that's usually where a lot of the difficulty comes in to filling in the form. Where the measurements go, where the limits, that's really the easy part. And even in many cases, conditions, until you get into um, runtime conditions. And that, that's where we'd probably have to help you understand how to do that in this, per the standard. Um, but all of the other piece is pretty good. Um, I think part of the challenge is mapping the um, run info and file info correctly so that you meet the standard because there's no, how do you say, standard in place today of what lot means or what program means or what, you know, it's just really challenging to describe that in such a way that people do it the same way in this new standard. That's the real challenge. Because even within TI, if I say lot, I get a different meaning. If I say fab lot, if I say, the, the thing I hate the most is what the um, sub lot or whatever that is in STDF, what the hell is that? It's different for everybody. And, and you know, I'm like, I, I, I totally didn't want any of that in RITDB because it doesn't have any meaning. If I can have any number of lot numbers I want, give me a name that has meaning, right? And so that's usually the challenge that I found in integrating something into RITDB is trying not to fit it the way that you do it in the old way, but actually thinking of what is this really? You know, did I, you know, if I don't have it in the spec, give me in a proper name that tells the user what it really is, right? That's the challenge, but you have an opportunity to really make it transparent to the end user what this data means, right? Which I think is a unique opportunity we haven't had in a long time. <laughs> okay, so the next piece, I'm just gonna kind of give you a quick overview. I know we only have 10 minutes, so I'm gonna do this really quick, of what is in a client. And like I said, we will have subsequent webinars where we go over this in much more detail. But I wanna kind of give you an idea of some of the features in the client that, that were beyond the generation of the event or the data. Okay, so there's some other um, capabilities that a client has that are really critical. So here you'll see is just kind of an overview of a test floor. So we have the RIDDB infrastructure. There's a broker with some kind of application sitting on top of that broker. And then we have a client, could be any kind of client, and this is say a non-tester client, which has a broker and some kind of apps. Could be your PC on your desk, right? Um, and then we have a tester, which has a RIDDB client and maybe some RIDDB apps sitting on the tester or maybe some that are kind of sitting off the tester like an edge appliance that's connected into the broker, right? So this is just the conceptualization of what a test floor might look like in a RIDDB infrastructure. One of the key things I, I guess I should mention, and this helps isolate you from network issues because the broker is within the test cell. So everything within the test cell is on one broker. If the rest of the network goes down, who cares? I can keep running up until the time I need something from off the tester, right? So it, it keeps everything, and it's very quick because the response time within the broker, within the test cell is very fast. So I can do lots of things on the tester that maybe I can't do if I'm going off tester out to the network on the LAN and back. So the next thing is kind of showing you uh, an example. So this is one where the RIDDB client is not integrated into the OS, but it's kind of sitting with the OS. So there's this communication, and it could be bi-directional tester OS to RITDB client. In this case, it's a single direction. We're just pulling stuff out of the client. We can't tell the client to do anything in, in this case. I, I mean, we can't tell the tester OS to do anything. We're just pulling from the data. So it's an independent install. So here's an example of some stuff we've done, right? So if you were native in the tester, I would want a little bit more out of this system, but this is assuming it's a non-native RITDB client installation. So the independent, uh, it's an independent install. It's not dependent on tester OS version. 
we have a sourcing client, the ReadyV sourcing client handles the connection to the broker, handles the messaging support, handles the authentication of the client to the system, client configurations, and deals with actions where I'm asking, you know, send a ReadyV action message to the tester. It handles publishing of the events or state in real time. We've got the real real time uh, data log stream, so both wafer and unit data collection, uh, wafer strip unit whatever, publishing the RITDB data log stream, equipment log. This is tester inventory, so um, we're able to collect the tester inventory and send it out now. When we do equipment logs, we actually send a RITDB container through the message. It's a very small container, so we typically just send the container itself through the message. Um, file monitoring, so we have the ability to monitor a file and generate events whenever there's new file content. And then directory monitoring, so we have the ability to monitor a directory and notify when new files appear. Now, why did we do this bottom one where we're just notifying new files appear? Hey, if I do a tester diag, it's too big a file to send via message. I don't really want to use up my network bandwidth by sending files that way. I might tell it, hey, there's a new file and I have some other process behind the scenes which goes and grabs the file off the tester and moves it somewhere. But doing that, I know it exists. I know the name of the file. I know when it appeared. So now I can align it with other events that are happening on the tester. So that's why you need this kind of directory monitoring kind of capability. Keep in mind, I guess I'm just going to say this, this is from a perspective of integrating RITDB on a legacy tester or on a tester where the vendor won't do it for you. Okay. okay. So just a few features. So the client runs as a daemon on the tester. Typically, we set it up as a service. It's a little bit trickier to do this on a Windows tester. You, you can do it, but there's a little bit more work. Um, it's not quite as robust as Linux uh, service. But we're running it as a service. It connects to the broker, and the tester client's authenticated before it's granted access to the RITDB system. So we have a process where it connects to the broker. Once it's connected to the broker, it has to go through some authentication process to be able to connect to the system. Right. We have something called a node key. Uh, the node key is an identity for the tester. That node key has to be authenticated, basically. And it's basically tied to the serial ID of the tester. So we have to have these node keys created. We, we can create a node key on the fly, but you have limited access to the system unless you have an authenticated node key on the system. Okay. And of course, we could do public-private key stuff. In, internally in TI, we haven't really done any encryption because we don't need it. We're all in an internal test floor, right? But um, it, it's kind of dependent on your situation. And then we have published custom events that are RITDB compliant. So we've done a lot of custom events that are converted. They're utilizing a RITDB topic structure, but a custom topic. And they're doing the CBOR bodies, but it's a custom body. And then we're using uh, something that we call reflectors. Remember, I had mentioned reflectors earlier today to convert those custom events into RITDB standards. So that's how we get through this. And, and it's actually given us a lot of flexibility because, you know, the standard before it was published was, yeah, maybe we do this, maybe we do that. Hey, now all we do is tweak the reflector. We're done. We're standard compliant again. So it makes it a little bit easier that way. So just kind of some of the things, we have equipment logs. And we produce an equipment log whenever a session starts or in some cases on certain platforms when a program is loaded. So that's really when do you produce an equipment log? You have to think about when is there an opportunity to change something in the tester. And that's the frequency by which you generate equipment logs. So it's kind of unique by platform, but you kind of have to sit and think, okay, if this tester was idle for this amount of time, maybe there was an opportunity for something to do something on the test or install software, install whatever, I'm going to produce in a new equipment log at that time. Ready to be data logs. So we're streaming a, a data log window with every touchdown. So if you do, let's say, by 16, then that window will include those 16 devices for, for that um, uh, multi-site card. Okay? So it's not necessarily one unit at a time, it's one touchdown at a time. 
And touchdowns can be quite big. You know, some of these can get up to, you know, 100 sites per run, I mean, per touchdown. So, um, you know, that, that varies a bit. So session events. So this is the, we stream tester events as they happen. Think of these like session start or stop, um, lot start or stop, program load, unload, you know, d different events like this that I call session events, things that are happening within the run. And then we have test events. So stream test events as they happen. Uh, test start and stop, uh, binning, uh, alarms, you know, these types of events can get very detailed. So within the RITDB client, we have the ability to turn on or off those events being emitted through the client, okay? And then file monitoring, we have through uh, messaging, I can set up another, a new file monitor. So this is not something where I have to go to the tester and do it. I can, through a message, update the RITDB client config file and set up a new file monitor utilizing messages. And then once I release the new config file, the new file monitor starts. Same thing with directory monitoring. I can watch a directory and via a message to update the config of the client, I can turn on or off a directory monitor. So what's the test event logging? So a tester a client captures test events and then publishes the info as a RITDB event. So here, for example, test flow start and stop. Um, kind of hard to see, I guess. Um, over here in the flow, you can see here, there's a start test flow event. So whenever I fall into the start test flow, hey, I get a test flow start event, and I might get multiple attributes. Might be the part list, the site list, whatever it is that is related to this event. And I can have custom events here that are, are unique to my platform. Then we have bin events. So maybe when I reach to binning, I have a bin event and in there I might push out, this is the parts, the sites, this is the bin that was resolved or, or dispositioned for the part, right? And so I might have an individual bin event. Now let's say I have the RitDB data log event. So this is the point where I publish the data log stream. So here I might push the, the data log. So I'm just trying to show how within this flow, within the, single, you know, within a run and single insertions of a part, I can have events that are generated at each one of these steps, depending on the kind of the level that you want. Um, within the standard, we have the high level events, but which we expect to be admitted, but within the test flow, those are kind of, they're available to be admitted, but you know, you can make your choice. Okay. So again, the RITDB system, that, that we have collects the data, aggregates the events into RITDB containers, and then archives them in the MDIR. So the way we have it today is, let's say I have a single site device and I emit per touchdown, the archiver or the collector will collect the data into, let's say, 50 unit chunks and then push it into the MDIR. So I never would lose, um, I, I always have most of the data, so I, my, Potential for data loss when, let's say, a tester crashes is really small um, in terms of the number of units data that I might lose. Right? So the, the way we've designed it, because, you know, for example, we've got some where we have a million diaper wafer. And if you have to wait till the end before the STDF gets written and then saved, you've lost all of that data. Who can afford to retest a million die per wafer if on the 900,000 die, it died, right? So the idea is, well, we want to ensure that we collect everything as robustly as possible and the data is sharded. So I don't have one big giant SQ, you know, STDF file with a million die in it. I have lots of tiny files that I can keep track of. And we keep track of how many files we have, which part it, you know, which part it is, how many, you know, what's the min and max part number in there, et cetera. So I know how many files I should have to make up a run and I can join them together. But it's a lot easier to query 10 small files than one big giant one. It's also a lot easier to transfer 10 smaller files than one big giant one. So I think it, it helps to solve some of that file movement problem too. 
Here's an example of some events, just so that you guys can see. So here's the topic structure, as Mark mentioned. There's the identity. It tells us, you know, the unique ID of the client. Here I have a RITDB data log is in the topic. I'm sending a window, and you can see that I've got my min part is 426, max part is 427, part count is 2. Uh, and I believe this is a dual site card. That's why you've got two parts. And then you'll see it's part of, so we got this unique key that tells us it's part of something. So this tells us which run that these units are part of. And then I've got the sort order. So this is the 224th touchdown, right? And then it's a type window. And here you'll see byte size of this. So my data is in this binary thing that in my logger tool, I don't translate and show because it would, you know, muck up, you know, just fill up my logger tool. Again, here's an example of just a standard event. So here I've got a device status testing info begin. So here I'm doing a test info. I can tell you which cell it's on. This is the date. This is um, the event action assignment event. And then there's some data here, which custom data for TI. But you know, I, I figure you knowing one die and one wafer in one random place is probably not going to be very helpful to you, but it's a die ID basically that, that is recorded. And over here you'll see, I guess I did the same thing, but this is just a second event, you know, action assignment event that gives us uh, some additional data. So again, you can see we've got lots of different events. These are um, the standard attributes are these at the top, right? And then there's, drives are crazy. Um, and the, the items down here are kind of custom stuff. Okay. So RedDB events are classified into, into uh, categorized into classes. So here you can see if we look at events, we've come up with these classes of events. We call them an event class. So there's an event class attribute gives you error, warning, emergency. Emergency would be an event where you want somebody to act upon immediately. It's not just an error, it's a, you know, it's a, you know, fire. Um, attend to it now. So there are very rare events which are classified as emergency, but we needed the class to allow us to do that. Then you've got cell status, cell setup, run info, summary and progress. Key difference between summary and progress is a summary is a summary of everything that's happened so far, and a progress is the progress since the last time you saw something, right? So everybody wants it differently, so we ended up with two different classes. Actually, the run progress makes it easy to do a, a chart so that you can see how well you're doing relative to the past, whereas a run summary is a much more difficult thing to do that way. So, you know, they, they're both useful depending on what kind of reporting you want to do. Device status, so this is a device level, so part level. And then your equipment status, this is for non-cell equipment. Let's say I wanted to send some event that gives you some notice about a load board or a contact or something. And then a derived event, which is those computed events, right, where we take facts and create a derived event. And a watermark, which is used for alignment of batch windows. And then MES is something we're playing with to send an MES event so we can say, hey, a lot split, a lot combine, a lot log in, a lot log out, or I don't know what people call it. We call it log in and log out in TI, but I guess where you uh, move into a step and then you move out of a step in your MES system. Um, and then we have OEE states, and you'll see here we've got the different colors, and I think you saw on the chart I showed before, you know, gray, green, red, blue, orange, yellow. Um, these are suggestions, not requirements, really, but we just highlighted this so that when we do a chart that people can easily see, hey, you know, am I productive or not productive? Is there a down situation, et cetera? Um, and here you'll see that a little tool that we have, so up at the top you'll see the name of the tool and the last event that was emitted. And then down here it's that scrolling window that I'd showed you before. Um, this is an older version of the tool, but um, without markers. But this just kind of shows you the status in a rolling window. So again, I just kind of wanted to show you guys some stuff on the data log. So we've got a RitDB client publishes data log each, each touchdown. In the case, what we did is we created both a pre and post script. And FYI, we did a, a post script on the equipment log as well so that we could 
you know, add to it before it gets sent and becomes immutable. <laughs> before it gets off the, it's immutable once you've sent it to the system, but while you're sitting on the tester during the generation of the file, I can tweak it as needed. So um, in the case of the data log, we have a pre and post script. Why pre and post? There's certain things that may happen at the beginning I need to do, and then I need to put some stuff in at the end. So these pre and post scripts are run. It allows me to add TI custom data to what the vendor produced for me. And then the data log messages are handled by the system and can transfer the data as needed to support customization. The data log topic is monitored, collected into larger chunks, and then pushed into the MDIR. So here's an example. Um, you can see over here, it's kind of hard to see, but you can see there's a window, and here you can see this number, 6, 7, 16, 8, 9. That's kind of which window it is. And you know, it's mixed, so I've got multiple testers coming out at once. So here's 5, 9, 5, 9, so these both Tester 5 and 9 are producing data, and they have different windows that are being generated. And of course, this is all the data coming across. And you can see here, it's the timestamp um, as the data is being generated. So this is just a logger window where I'm just kind of showing you the fact that I can see events kind of popping across the screen. And you know, this, by the way, was from a factory over in Asia, and I was grabbing this data off my desk. So it's just, it's actually faster for me to connect from my desk than to VPN and do it from the computer because the graphics are so slow coming back that it, it's faster for me to just look at it this way. Yes? Most of the times I see the event is the same and the only difference is how big it is. Yes, those are two different touchdowns. Yeah. So this, this number right here that you see where it says RITDB data log slash and then a number slash, that's the um, well, not really touchdown. You think of it as the window number, right? Yeah. So that, that increments. Well, actually, this is what the message ID. But, but we match, in this case, uh, when it's a data log window, the message ID and the window number kind of match up. But yeah, so we just keep getting these and then you can basically, you could subscribe to a particular tester and monitor that and then do something to show graphics. You could subscribe to all testers. We do have a lookup of tester to platform. So you could say, oh, let me go look up which testers are for say 93K and then I'm gonna go monitor all of those. Cause you notice platform's not on the topic structure. So you kind of have to then know which testers you want to see. But our system, we do have, of course, all the testers are registered with the node key. And within the node key, there's lots of attributes about the tester you could use. And then we're building a kind of a tester to group kind of address book where you could have testers grouped any number of ways. So you within our system could go, look, I want testers from this group and then subscribe to that. And then it would show you the report. So there, there's things like that that have to be dealt with in the application. So I think that's the last slide. So like I say, we have RITDB data log per touchdown. The archiver collects them and then pushes them into the MDIR. When we go in using a tool in the MDIR, I could pull up any one of the part ofs that I want to using the metadata, find the one of interest. Like I say, you can amend the metadata to put in information about how well this um, part did, you know, if you want to mark it as being more interesting than the other parts, you could. Okay? So that's some of the stuff we're playing with is how do you, how do you identify that something's interesting <laughs> and mark it? Right? Yep. So that's the end of the kind of client overview. Um, any, any questions? Questions at this point. We, we've run out of material. <laughs> so you speak of some of the tools just that you have. Just let me just, I want everybody on the line. Uh, you've repeatedly spoken of the tools that you have, some software that's been developed as part of this. I mean, are you including that as part of the standard or what's the, and if so, what's your licensing mechanism for that? The um, translator tool is included with some source code, and Mark can answer to the rest. 
Yeah, you can just talk to me. We're, we're, it, we ship a lot of this stuff as part of our product. So if you're one of our customers, it's it's there. We've had a lot of discussions with people. You know, we're pretty flexible on licensing it, but they're they're open source tools, so they're sort of as is, where is, and we're trying to decide if people want to pay for that. But uh, right now, all of the stuff you see there is probably ten thousand lines of Java code total. So just contact me if you're interested. We'll work out something. We're not charging for it. If it's a typical open source thing. If we were to charge for it, it'd be for support. But our goal here is actually to come up with an infrastructure that doesn't require any IT, you know, doesn't require any expertise outside of being a product engineer. And, you know, we, we've got a couple interns right now working on a JavaScript version. We're doing a, a version of this, the tools in JavaScript, so you could um, use, like, React or something like that to make your own dashboards. But, you know, we've got a couple interns doing that. You want that? No. I'll sell you my interns, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, the question on that is if, if somebody wants to play with some of this stuff, just contact me. The, my email's on the, on the uh, site at SEMI. Okay, any other questions? Anything? What about the other versions that are available outside of Java? Are those also available for open source? <laughs> Uh, no, the C++ was written by Adventist, so I don't know that they would yeah. <laughs> hand that out, but um, pretty much it was not that bad. We took examples. So in an implementer's meeting that we're going to have soon, follow-up workshop, will probably give you all the basics you need to put a client together pretty easily. Once yeah. you got familiar with RITDB, the development of the client went very quickly. The majority of work we did with admin test was really around some of the subtleties of their platform. Yeah. What um, she's trying to say is if you have a modern Linux, it'll be a lot easier. <laughs> well, we, we didn't exactly move to Red Hat 7, so I, mean, I, can't, I, can't, I don't know that I can um, <laughs> Be be uh, too. Uh... Yeah, if you're yeah, using yeah, something yeah. that's it, it um, Red Hat Seven or later, then all of the the open source tools for MQTT just run perfect. You know, all the libraries, everything. If you try to go back, and you know, a lot of legacy stuff does go back, and it gets substantially harder as we go back, and and. Uh, Yeah. Well, that that's great, except for the huge floors we have. That's not going to help, and 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 um, and and so it's more like, what's your biggest fleet? Well, that's yeah. what you're going to work on. So, um, but yeah, it it it's a good lesson in what the standard needs to do to help people make a whole floor written be. So, you know, I, I think that's a good thing. Where someone has the opportunity to really have huge impact with the newer platforms, I think that's definitely a great way to go because you'll learn so much that doing legacy, you figure out what are the parts of legacy are useful to me and those are the ones I'm going to implement. Because you don't need everything if it's, if you don't need to improve your yield from 97 to 98, then maybe there's other places in legacy that yeah. you do want to monitor, like is the tester up or down or this. Maybe that's the minimal kind of thing that I want on my legacy tester. I don't need all the other stuff. I don't need data logs. Right? If I only need basic events, that's a heck of a lot easier to implement than all of the other parts. Right? So yeah, the, I think yeah. you can make choices. The question there was about why not just roll it off in totally. And we put a lot of effort to make this an overlay you know, so that it works independently. And the issue we run into on tests, you know, I've got testers out there 25 years old, is that there are very few green fields in, in assembly and test. And so if we go in there and say, you've got to make the conversion, the answer is, you know, someday, somewhere, somehow. If we go in and say, well, you're making a lot of little ad hoc things anyway, why don't you ad hoc on top of this, then that's much more, you know, we get better response on that. Uh, it's just being pragmatic. But I, I can't say it does start to open people's ideas, and the biggest challenge we have is slowing them down yeah. while we try to yeah. build the infrastructure robustness. So um, be, because people start getting, 
oh, you know, well, I can do that and I can do that. What about that? You know, like, yeah, all of those things are possible. Let's get the infrastructure in place first. So it can really start to trigger some ideas on uh, how to use it because it really does kind of open this plug and play kind of capability across your test floor. And, and that can be really exciting with all the features that you can do. Like, oh, you know, so much easier for me to interface with one system and then you do 20 apps against it. I don't care. I'm giving you the data. You know. um, yeah, the nice thing that we're seeing about just having it is um, it's much easier to write RITDB files than STDF files, trust me. <laughs> And it's actually easy to append to them as you're going. So it's much easier, like if we wanted to add load board temperature, or, or maybe there's some sensors starting, you know, the, the proteotech time put sensors on your chip, is how do you log all this sensor information? You know, it's, we end up doing these generic text records, or we do these binary files, or we do a whole different stream. The thing we can do with RITDB is, is make that standard. And then I can tell you the, the query thing is just so nice. You know, sit there and write a SQL query and start pulling stuff out is there's Python notebooks, there's, there's R, there's tons of tools out there. Once we get it in SQLite, there's tons of free tools. Yeah. And so it's, it, it's really powerful. I will say one of the biggest challenges to get over first is making sure your IT security is comfortable with a broker in your environment. And that's the first thing to get over that hurdle so that you don't have that challenge, right? <laughs> and, um, you know, we, we were able to do it on the manufacturing side. There's still some of their areas in TI where they're like, mm -mm, you, you can't have it. So we figured out alternate ways of dumping data into, let's say, an Oracle database for the things that people need in that other environment. Say, okay, go, go grab it from there. Um, At subcons, you mean? Um, we have not requested that yet. Um, although it, we kind of got them used to it because it became part of our um, standard software that we put on for programs. So I, I guess we're kind of getting them used to it in an alternate way. Now the key question is how much data are they going to let you stream off because you don't, they don't want you to see it. I mean, we've already had that challenge because of our old event system and how much they don't want us to see what they're really doing um, on, <laughs> you know, it, you know it, it's I, really yeah. challenging to understand the, the STDF file coming from a subcon because you have, no, I mean, like, how did I have 500 more units than went into the run? So like, <laughs> you, you dumped them into the hander in a circular fashion or something, I don't know. But that can be challenging. So we, we will address that at some point, but our goal was to become really robust internally. The beautiful thing is, though, um, it's much easier to share. Once, once you get them to agree to it, it's a much easier process to, to um, share across because you've got that whole encryption thing and maybe we deal with it by it agreeing on what to encrypt and not encrypt in the system. Right. The question had to do with uh, putting this in a subcon. You know, there's a huge push right now for edge compute throughout all of the tester companies and so we're all talking about having edge computers now and as soon as you start talking that we talk about how we're going to interconnect them. So I, I think and are we going to use the cloud or not use the cloud? You know, we, we don't really do much cloud stuff because it's not that safe. But these are questions that are industry wide. I think they're going to be dealt with. People are going to have to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Sounds very good. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> like I said, we're going to do <laughs> follow up webinars. So let us know, you know, like the implementers, we will do segments of code to show you how to do it. Okay. Oh, yeah.